So, uh, welcome everybody to today's DNI debate. Um, I think we've got to go have a really good debate today. Um, the title, as you know, of the debate today is What's the Point of Research? Um, and we've got um, Trevor Hardy, who's the CEO from the Future Laboratory, who are a trend um, forecasting and innovation agency. So he's going to tell you about the work that they do at the Future Laboratory and how they um, use research at the Future Laboratory. And then, coming from a completely different angle, is um, Sheena Calvert, who most of you know, um, who's a designer and academic, and she's going to argue a very kind of different point of view of what the point of research is. So we're going to start with um, Trevor, and then we're going to have Sheena, and then we're going to have a debate, um, hopefully with everybody in the room. Okay. Thank you very much for, for having us here today. I, I feel completely inadequate, because I was just told that Sheena's present a presentation, she's got slides, she's got a handout. And all, I, all I've got is this. So it's going to be, it's going to be an absolutely miserable presentation. But um, we, are, we are, as Lou said, we're taking two sides of a, of a debate, two sides of a topic about research. And both of us come from very different worlds, so it's been somewhat easy to take different views on it. Although we're taking a stance that in some cases, we may be fluid on, we may be fluid on our, our opinion on this. But um, my my view of research is somewhat somewhat based on my on my career. Um, I have spent most of my career in advertising, and um, and before that, I uh, I spent I was in management consulting, which is probably the furthest thing away from what you guys are studying today. But, um, I spent most of that time in advertising, and advertising uses research, advertising agencies use research to help their clients and their brands, help companies understand consumers, understand what brands mean, understand what they mean, understand what products we should sell. We use it to evaluate whether an advert is going to be good, whether people will like it or dislike it, whether they throw things in the telly or will flock into shops. We use it to inform whether a product will be something that people will want or something that people will hate and use it to refine that. So it's a very, it's a very uh, goal-focused, goal-oriented use of research. Um, in some cases, I've, I've always said my background in, in advertising was a career in post rationalization which is which is something that all of us um, think should be quite good at, by the way, and we can talk about that later. But uh, these days I work at a company called The Future Laboratory, and our, our view of research is, is very different in a way. Most marketing companies, most strategies are developed with a, a simple process of where are we now, where do we want to go, and how are we going to get there. And our view of the Future Lab is, is slightly different. We, we look at where will the world be in two, three, five, ten, twenty 20 years. <coughs> And then how are we going to help people or brands or organizations adapt to that future? And we use research to understand where will the world be? Where will, what will consumers be thinking? What will people be thinking? What will the markets be doing? What will the role of brands or the role of products be in, in years to come? And so research is a very different animal for that. So I, um, I thought I'd just talk, maybe give you a sense of the kinds of research that we do and the future lab, um, and then talk about my point of view on, on research. And I don't have anything to show you, but uh, if you close your eyes, perhaps, you'll, you'll imagine what I'm talking about. Um, there's a number of things I can't talk about because a lot of the work we do is, is confidential to the clients we do it for. But last, um, this spring, this summer, we, I'm not sure if you might have visited Selfridges, we did a, um, an installation there in their wonder room called Fragrance Lab. And we did it in partnership with Selfridges and a perfume brand called Givaudan. Um, and the research we did, the, the experience itself was a, uh, an attempt to personalize products, to give you a product that would be perfectly suited to your personality and to yourself. And we did three kinds of research to help, to help inform that and develop that experience. The first was doing a lot of personality profiling research, so spending a lot of time with people and understanding their personalities, doing a lot of interviews, watching them, asking questions, and some statistical analysis as well, to get to a personality profiling, a list of person, different personalities. And we didn't want to just use a traditional personality prof profiling tool or matrix or book or theory, because in the end we needed to match these to a product that matched the fragrances, so we knew what the end had to be. The second bit of research we did was with the, the fragrance company to understand how we could match personalities to scents or to the building blocks of fragrances in which fragrances conjured up which feelings in people so we could do an effective match. If you are an optimistic person, we know that you would be 
really, really attuned to sandalwood, for example. Uh, and the third bit of research was with the people who visited the shop. It was a completely immersive experience where you had to, you were exposed to different, different options, different stories, different pictures, different sounds, different smells, different personality traits, and you had to choose what you were as you went along this journey. And at the end of the journey, you were not only presented with who you are, which was a bit of a scary thing for some people, but then presented with the fragrance that best suited your self. And in some cases, that fragrance was repellent to people because they didn't quite like it, but it was an interesting experiment because this is the one that represents you, even if you're not comfortable with who you are. Um, the second bit of research that, that we did recently was with a company called Yuna, which is probably a firm that nobody knows, but they are Britain's largest benefits provider. They help companies um, be more financially secure in the way they provide services and benefits and, and financial support to their companies. But we did a, a bit of research for them to understand what the workplace of the future would look like, what the, what the, uh, what the environment, what the job, what the, uh, serve, what the facilities and services people, companies would provide to employees in 2030, for example. And we did a few different kinds of research with that. We did a lot of interviews with employees, with employers. We asked them about what their ideal job would be, their ideal environment, their ideal workplace, their ideal uh, um, uh, co-workers, and the things that they would get the most joy and fulfillment and satisfaction out of. And we also did the same with employers, on what would be the best type of employee for you, the best type of product, the best type of success for your company, and how could people and the workplace contribute to that. This was a mix of interviews, as I said, a lot of surveys, statistical surveys, quantitative surveys, as we call them, um, and observing, just observing, because a lot of the time people will tell you things that are what they think, but not really what they feel or what they need. And our, our research has resulted in a, in a <coughs> significant piece of uh, discourse, publicity for not just Unum, but a lot of people who consult in the HR field about how the workplace should be more intuitive. They should understand people more, how it should be more collaborative. The people don't just work in cubicles anymore. They work with other people and they need to talk to them. How the workplace of the future is going to be uh, much more mindful. It's a, it's, I, I suppose it's somewhat trendy these days to be mindful and to be more present as we're working, but the workplace is a place that steals mindfulness from you and how can a workplace foster more <coughs> more uh, effective work and more fruitful work to be more mindful. And ageless was the last one. And it's one of those things that's, that's interesting, especially speaking to people who are half my age, but um, the workplace used to weed out people over 45 or 50 and would send them slowly, send them on their way. And now there's a lot of people who are having their best ideas, their best work, their most freed up mind state when they reach 50 or so. And having a workplace that can be as open and as welcoming to somebody in their later years as they are in their early years is something that a lot of companies are starting to think about. That's enough about my, my stuff. I can, I can talk about it at length, but it's tremendously boring. But my point of view on research, and this is where I think I'm in trouble, as I have two, <laughs> two, two pronged attack nice. to, the, uh, to the views of research. Uh, the first one, my, my, yeah, my, stance, my stance on research today is that research has to have a purpose, that it has to be goal-oriented. And, and I suppose the first The first point of view I have on it is that um, one of the afflictions of modern life is that there is too much information, there's too much data, there's too much stuff out there. And we as consumers, but also we as, as people who work in companies, advise, advise companies, advise brands about what they might be doing and, and selling them products or giving them design or giving them creative ideas, are just more and more stuff, more information, more options, more data. And, And that is one of the things that's causing a lot of problems these days. There was, um, there was a book uh, years ago called uh, uh, The Paradox of Choice um, by a guy named Schwartz, I think. And uh, it basically said, he did this fun, these fantastic experiments where you would go into a supermarket with people and you would present people in front of the, the, uh, the jam aisle or the, or the soft drink aisle. And, There were usually around 22 different types of jam available. People, most people would walk away buying none. But then they took them to a different, different aisle, in a different store, six types of jam, everybody would choose one. And it's one of those things, those rare afflictions we have, where the more information we have, the harder it is to make decisions. And in our business at least, and in many businesses, we are hoping that people will make a decision with the thing we are presenting them with. Whether it's selling them a design, selling them an ad, selling them a a piece of consulting work or selling them a product. And research helps people make decisions. 
and um, I guess research in some ways helps weed out choices, it helps make choosing easier. So in the end, if you believe that, that this, in this paradox of choice, that more choice, more information actually causes anxiety, research, in my point of view, makes life better. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, but as I said earlier, my, sec my second strand is, is somewhat informed by my, by my probably about the best time of my life spent in, in advertising. And uh, there are so many great talents that come into advertising agencies, especially from the creative fields, that because there's so many different backgrounds from designers and writers, and now it's getting even more expensive with, with digital and other mediums. But researchers, strangely, were some of the most open-minded and creative people that, that sat in advertising agencies. And, and I suppose my, um, part of this was fueled by, I spent a lot of time, a lot of great agencies employ a lot of scriptwriters or screenwriters. And screenwriters, strangely, a lot of them start with the end in mind. They write, they, they often write their last scene before they write the beginning of the film. Or they know what the last scene will be so they know what they're working towards. And I suppose the same extrapolation is true. If we don't know where we're going, how are we ever going to get there? So research as a purpose needs a purpose before we start out with something. And and because I said if if we um, because I came in this uh, this sometimes I spent with days all my days would be spent rather than conceiving it would be spent post rationalizing. We have a great idea, we have a bonkers idea. This thing is fantastic. How can we sell it? And a lot of time it wasn't about going from step A to step B to step C to step D and finally you get to this magnificent thing. Logic doesn't work that way. But it was we've got this piece of magic. How then can I use research to tell people the narrative, tell people the logic, and convince people that this is the right thing to do? So, um, research in that sense is the thing that the only way to get people to buy the narrative of your brilliant, crazy, bonkers, fantastic, magical ideas. And that's my soul story. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, good morning. Hello. Hi. Um, thank you for coming. Um, I've been up since 5 a.m. writing this, uh, uh, doing this presentation. Um, Lou asked me to take a very strong position on this question of research, and so I have done so. Um, the thing is that actually I do believe in what I'm about to say to you, but it's so on the other end of the spectrum from this uh, lovely gentleman's uh, position that uh, you're going to have to bear with me. I think research, the word research is absolutely pointless. Um, I'm going to turn off the lights. Can we turn the lights back? And I'm going to explain to you why. Um, we need a tiny bit of light on too, right? <laughs> Sorry, I've just realised we've been plunged into darkness. Um, that's fine. Um, Gore Vidal, the great writer Gore Vidal, um, said, every time I hear the word culture, I reach for my gun. He hates culture. He hates the word. I feel the same way about research. Every time I see the word research, I get depressed. Who else feels like that? Hands up. Who's like, oh, I've got to do some research. I'm expecting to see a lot more hands. <laughs> we're not doing a poll, we're not counting, we're not researching, but it's kind of like, oh my God, I've got to do some research. Um, I feel like this. Having done a PhD, I also feel this very strongly. Okay, let's go back. Okay, Albert Einstein, great researcher, we would, uh, we would definitely say, right? If we knew what it was we were doing, it wouldn't be called research, would it? Even Einstein advocates for being lost, completely lost, and not having any clue what the object of your research is. So to say that research is object-oriented, and I'm fascinated by um, your, sort of, um, your sort of admission of post-rationalization. We have a great idea. We think it's fantastic. Let's go do some research and say how great it is, you know? I mean, how bogus does it get? Seriously, I mean, really, you know? So anyway, so, um, so I think uh, Albert Einstein agrees with me that we don't, uh, you, know, we, you know, research is about being lost. Re research cannot be quantified because there is no objective truth to be hunted down. Research is therefore aimless. What I really object to is the idea that we see surveys and we see quantitative statistics and they kind of give the illusion of being truthful. Bullshit. 
absolute bullshit. What they do is they present a certain position on information that they've gone out and found and make it look objective and truthful. When in actual fact, as you've just admitted rather wonderfully, it's very often post-rationalized, right? Yeah? A bit quieter now, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, so I would argue that because we are creative people here, I'm coming in from a very particular position, um, that research, if we if we look at it as something that we go out and we're trying to we're trying to objectivize our work, we are sorely misguided. Um, research for me is wandering. It's about being confused. It's about being overwhelmed. It's about editing out nothing and about getting lost. Einstein was lost in his research. Most everybody that I've ever known who does proper research. Not the kind of research that I think is implied by this word. As we were discussing outside, the word research has become really devalued. We see research on the assessment criteria. Kira's going to hit me in a minute. Um, we see research separated out as something we do separately from our work. Yeah, And this, I think, is the real problem. Research is about this level of confusion. It's really about being lost. And I thought this was an interesting statement. The mind works on the data it receives very much as a sculptor works on his block of clay. The world we feel and live in will be that which our ancestors and we, by slowly cumulative strokes of choice, have extricated out of this huge amount of information like sculptors by giving certain portions, rejecting certain things and bringing certain other things to the fore. So I might go on the search for something in terms of research. There is no objectivity. I may go out and find a completely different body of information in the same research field as you. We could do two different um, forms of data analysis. We're going to come up with completely different, completely different interpretations of that analysis, like sculptors making a different sculpture out of the same piece, out of, out of a similar piece of uh, marble or clay. So I'm really trying to kind of, you know, indicate that we're in this maze. We're just in this maze and there isn't anything objective. So research is for me cathartic. If you're not struggling, if you're not suffering, if you're not weeping, um, then you're not researching. I had this when I did my PhD. I was crying like a baby when I had to read uh, this horrible book called by Adorno uh, and I couldn't understand it. And I remember that my supervisor, she just said to me, stop feeling so sorry for yourself. It's an edifice you're going to have to climb step by step. And, you know, I kind of understood that it wasn't just about, I had to understand this one thing, that I had to just take this journey and throw myself into the unknown without any map and without any goal. Because if you see research as goal-oriented, all you're doing is researching into the single thing that you're looking for. You're not looking around you. So Maurice Blanchot, beautiful, beautiful writer, said, all research is crisis. It's the turn of seeking. It's the crisis, the kind of critical turning. It's the constant mulling over of something. The wrong bus. If you think research is about finding something in a completely objective way, then you are on the wrong bus because there's no such thing. Research, academic, goal-oriented, particularly within the fields that we work in, is about blinkering yourself to everything that doesn't already fit the category of what you're looking for. Research is also elitist and treated as exclusive when separated out as an academic commercial activity and frequently pointless. Let me give you an illustration of that. We are now in a situation in academia where um, we live and die by our academic research. I have a partial research position at another university. I am required to produce X number of papers per year, attend X number of conferences, and um, just, you know, kind of like produce stuff. And half the time, it's absolute nonsense. Because you have to do it. It's not authentic. It's separated from what you do as a human being, as an individual. And there's so much now that passes for academic research just because the universities get funded on the basis of the quality of the research of the individuals who work for them, that is completely and utterly pointless. And any academic will tell you this. 
So this is the kind of thing that we have passing as research. And this is a real example. Pointless research. The position of a penguin during defecation, physical parameters used to calculate the necessary pressure to expel shit across a distance of 40 centimetres. This is a real example of research. I kid you not. Another example of research is that uh, rats can, can't always tell the difference between Japanese spoken backwards and Dutch spoken backwards. This one for linguistics in 2007. These are academic research papers. These are real, these are not fake. The Linguistics Nobel Prize winner. In fairness, they were trying to find out similarities between human infants and other mammals. But all they did was show the world that rats don't speak Japanese backwards. Rats don't hear Japanese backwards. Uh, another example, you can extract vanilla flavouring, apparently, from cow dung. Do you notice there's a bit of a shit thing going on here? Um, chemistry 2006. Maybe you can, but would you eat it? Now, what is the point of this research? Could somebody please illuminate me? There's none. Absolutely none, right? It doesn't benefit, doesn't make your life better, doesn't do anything. I don't feel like eating that ice cream right now on the basis of that. And this is kind of, in a way, my favourite. Why woodpeckers don't get headaches? The winner for ornithology. It's pretty baffling when you think about a pet, but, you know, woodpeckers headbutt trees for a living. And they experience uh, a thousand times more the, the force of gravity, the way they bang. So how do they pre prevent uh, brain injury? Uh, so you could say the difference between me as an ordinary person and a good scientist is I might think, I mean, I don't know about you, I got up this morning wondering about, you know, I get up every day wondering about why, you know, woodpeckers don't have brain damage. Um, not. Um, and the scientists will go out and find out. Apparently the reason why is their brains are more tightly packed into the skull. A smooth brain surface um, means that your brain isn't wobbling around and so it does, you don't get headaches. So, here's the PhD moment. Do you ever feel like your research is insignificant or pointless? Yeah, all the time. But then I'm reminded of the butterfly effect. It may appear insignificant. My research might, have, uh, might eventually have important repercussions. And then they're reminded of... I mean, nobody remembers who came up with it, so it doesn't really matter anyway. So this, for me, is the perfect illustration of academic research. You do something that looks clever and uh, passes as academic research. To see research as oriented toward goals is to render it a commodity and to make it a facet of capitalism. So, with great respect to my co-debater here, all the examples that he produced were about getting you to buy stuff come straight from advertising, straight through market research. I don't need to be associated... What was the smell you said? The smell you said you were associated with? Sandalwood. What was it you said? Sandalwood and optimism. Optimism. This is an absolute crock, really, frankly. And you, know, and you know it, and I know it, and it's completely and utterly pointless. We don't need to know this other than you want to sell us very expensive perfume that costs very little to actually make, that comes with about a 3,000% markup. So it's nothing more and nothing less than most research is produced uh, to make it a facet, facet of capitalism. And that's true of academia at the moment as well, because we are in a situation now where universities are businesses, they have to bring in money, therefore we go out and do research, we generate income, we get grants, we bring it in, we bring credit to the university and then that keeps the ball rolling. So um, the whole nature of research within the academy has changed. Quantifying research or trying to objectify, objectify it makes it subvert, sub subservient to other agendas. This process gives otherwise pointless and inaccurate research an air of authenticity and meaningfulness, attaching it to an illusory promise of, of objective truth. So it doesn't mean that anything's true because just because it comes in the form of something that looks research. <coughs> it's just because it's presented as research. Pharmaceutical companies are very fond of this. This isn't a pharmaceutical, I'll show you in a minute, but here's a classic example of a piece of nonsense research. Reaching risk managers online, 57%, 61%, 59%, using figures um, to attach um, meaningfulness to a piece of research that means nothing. This is absolutely classic. Um, so, sometimes research is dangerous. I'm going to show you an example. This pill... Thalidomide, produced in the 1950s, researched, but only up to a certain degree, okay, caused thousands of deformities in children in the womb. Um, highly, highly criticised, highly questioned later on, 
um, the actual company that produced it never admitted fully the wrongdoing. Between the launch of thalidomide and the grudging withdrawal of the drug in 1961, the uh, people who made it, Mertz and Mukta, massively promoted thalidomide in 52 countries. They said it was completely non-poisonous, astonishingly safe, fully harmless, completely safe for pregnant women and nursing mothers without any adverse effects on mother and child. Total lie, based on the research that they'd done, which was incomplete. This claim was a fraud. They did no tests for the effect on an embryo. Their stock line later was that nobody in the 50s realised that a pharmaceutical could reach the fetus. So there's a really serious example of when, you, uh, when research is very, very problematic. Research is also boring when separated out as an activity. If you think of, some, if you think of research as something you do rather than something you are, that is to say that something you're always doing, then you've entirely negated its purpose. Research makes you blind, it numbs your senses, it cuts you off from experience. Research is a meaningless category, it's just a word. In actual fact, research is everything. If you separate research from your life as a whole, then you've missed the point. So research is a forensic investigation into everything and nothing. This is my friend Alison Norlin's um, artwork. She's uh, from Canada. She's in, uh, she lives in Saskatchewan. And I've known her for probably close to 30 years now. Her work is enormous drawings of these mad things. She travels everywhere. She goes to shopping malls, these insane kind of fantasy spaces, etc. And she kind of is constantly, constantly traveling and collecting experiences. Um, Alison's really quite an amazing person. Um, she would say that research is untamed curiosity. It's not logical in that it isn't like you do one step after the other. Um, and that it's about experience, so that we should be in it all the time. Jean-Luc Godard said uh, when he was asked what he would take from a burning building, he said, I would take the fire. <laughs> I think research is the fire. When I see this work, I see it filled with the life experience of Alison Norlin, who is the most extraordinary, vibrant, dynamic human being, and who is constantly scanning the environment for information. She once told me that she loathes libraries, that she despises research. She's an academic and an artist, but she's fully immersed in, uh, you know, just sort of living and experiencing. Uh, this is what uh, someone said about her world, which I think is uh, really interesting. The world she makes reflects a world. She creates these enormous worlds within her work, um, and it's all, all also being taken apart. You tear it down, you rebuild it. Some of it still has the grime. The ever-changing elements is how we live and how we conduct ourselves. So we have to constantly compromise and change and be disappointed. So research into your life also involves failure. It means that you're going to be wrong sometime. So that inescapable moment of failing and just continuing to look and see is a condition of both life and art. This is a piece of work that I made, which I quite liked in the sense that it was this kind of very dry academic thing that I then made into a book, but I found this image that just said, leave. And it reminded me of this story. I was on a trip to Rio de Janeiro with Alison in 2008. As I arrived there off the flight, I sat down to read Foucault because I was in the middle of doing some quote unquote research for my PhD. She jumped up, slapped my book shut, shouted at me, we're very close friends so she can shout at me, and told me to go get out of my head and into the world. I was sitting in Rio de Janeiro reading Foucault and what she said to me was absolutely right. The research was outside, not in the books. I left the book behind and went into the blistering heat, into a world of sense and experience. We were there for carnival and ended up dancing along the Samba Drome, dressed as sugar canes. And that's research, and that was her point. The research wasn't in the book, the research was out there in the world. So I'm going to finish up now by saying that research is a fluid, intangible process that is absolutely not goal-oriented. It's every single breath you take. It's anarchy. It's non-intentional. It just is. Stop researching. Start living. Aimlessly wander in a universe of information, ideas, and experience, and see what, see what happens. And then you might just find something. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I was hearing lots of conversations about um, the two presentations we've had this morning. So I'm curious to hear questions and comments from all of you. Um, so should we start over here? Have you got any questions or comments? I heard that you were talking quite a lot. 
I guess we kind of just talk about random things or just kind of get the conversation going. But one thing that we kind of <coughs> thought was that kind of finding a middle ground between you guys and that research isn't to prove something. It's um, it's not to have an idea and then use research to prove it right. Um, but you should use it to answer a question. So seeing a question and knowing that the answer could be out there anyway, you might be lost a little bit to find it, but you kind of have to then find a path to stay focused on a little bit to get to an answer, I guess. So it's sort of like meeting in the middle where, um, yeah, it's not to prove something, but it's it's about answering a question is the purpose of research. So you, you, your point is you say you we need a specific question for the yeah. research to be fruitful. Right, yeah. So yeah, asking a question <coughs> instead of stating making a statement to mm -hmm. right is not answering an open question. Mm -hmm. I'd like to say something to that. Yes, I, I take the point and I think there's times when that's important, but I think there's also way too much of what I would call taking as a given what you set out to prove. I see that a lot when I read people's writing. They've decided what the answer is, and then they only go and research into things that will sort of prove what they've already decided is correct. So they're not actually doing any research. All they're doing is gathering information to support the position yeah. that they already had. So I guess what I'm saying is that you, you also have to be very um, aware of the potential for research to <coughs> knock you off path. If your research is about that humility before the fact that you may actually be completely wrong and you may need to go in another direction. I just see a lot of work like that. Is that humility possible in the industry that you work in, Trevor? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it is. It is absolutely not. I think, but I think there's interesting, it starts with a question and always does, but then I guess one thing is how do you know when, you've, when you should stop researching? How do you know when you've got the answer you need? And in some ways you need to, the question also needs to define in some ways what the answer will be or when your what your decision criteria is or when you'll be satisfied. There was um, there was some I mean we are we all believe that we're very rational, logical people, but there was there's a lot of research done on you know, <laughs> irrational um, but there's a lot of research done on, on how we don't make decisions in a rational, logical way. And and most of the stuff, even if, when you go by toilet toilet roll, you are to you are choosing, subconsciously you're choosing half a second before you reach for the one with the puppy on it. You have no idea why you're doing that. You're just doing it because it's soft, it's cute, or whatever it is, or you've seen it on telly. But we are researching a lot of things passively as well. So sometimes we're making decisions without really knowing we're making decisions about things. And sometimes that question or knowing what the, the answer will make us better inform people of better decisions. I think you're not talking about research, you're talking about justification. And that's very different. In a commercial situation, you're talking about, let's justify why we've done this. Research. Well, no, but it is you are you are equipping yourself with knowledge, information, rationale to make decisions, and that is mm -hmm. research to then justify. I mean, most of the stuff we do, whether we like it or not, is is irrational. So you post rationalize it even very very quickly, subconsciously. Mm -hmm. You'll post rationalize why I chose to have this lovely this lovely bag today mm -hmm. because it's lovely and colorful. But we will mm -hmm. collect ammunition. Why is going to be really lovely bag? Mm. And that collecting, collecting of ammunition is, is mm. research. I'm suspicious. <laughs> yeah. I would like to pick up if I could. I'd like to. How many people today are going to never step within 40 centimeters of a penguin? Or, <laughs> or because it's going to shit on you. Or tonight at the pub. At the pub, you are. Uh, what was the other one? Sorry, there was another one there. Penguin and the um, oh the woodpecker that's amazing isn't it amazing you're going to use that I bet all of you are going to use that fact woodpeckers peck thousands and thousands of times no brain damage amazing fact research <laughs> really changed my life yeah really did wasn't that doesn't that kind of help a little bit in um, like I know American football gets a lot of um, criticism because of the brain damage it's done to the football players that's not realized right when they're playing or after their careers. So isn't that kind of research something that can be used to understand something that we're doing as in our society and stuff to kind of understand where it's going from? So it might not have a specific answer, but it's sort of that path. If somebody is to try to find out 
how to fix that problem or where it's coming from, that might be where they get to when they're kind of wandering around trying to find, aimless, wandering aimlessly, that might be a, a fact that they come across and kind of bring it back. So is it kind of putting it out there so that somebody else might find it to apply to a separate question that they're trying to find an answer for? Mm -hmm. Maybe. I mean, I think, I think, you know, I was saying to Trevor outside, I mean, you know, people say to me, you know, well, I've got lots of friends who are not creative and they do other things like they're accountants or civil servants or whatever, and they say, well, you know, what does it mean to be creative? And I said, the only difference between artists, designers, creative people and you is that we notice things that you don't notice, that we kind of see things. And I think that that, that made sense to you, it was kind of noticing and, and then doing something with that noticing, yeah? And for me, that's research. So I guess I'm just, what I'm just trying to say is, there's that moment where somebody says you go and do something, go and do some research, and people go into the library or wherever they go, and they do like two or three hours of research, and then they say, "Here's my research," and I think, no, research is actually being fully immersed in what you're doing all the time and pulling things from what you're seeing. There may be times when you do a bit more focused research, but if you separate it out like that, then you've really missed the point, because if you're not committed to research, then you're not really doing it. Do what we're going to say. I was going to say, what about medical research? Where, because you brought up the the, the issue of, of, of brain damage. Um, I mean, surely for medical research, when you have a specific problem and you want to help a group of people, say for sure. example, you need that kind of goal oriented. This is the problem. How are we going to solve it? It's sure. not about being immersed in the carnival of Rio, is it? No, no, of course not. I mean, I'm making a very particular point about the kind of creative research that we do, no. But I also would say that there's still, there still is this kind of idea that anything that ends up having a research uh, paper attached to it somehow must be true, which a thalidomide example shows us. Do you know? This is a very dramatic example of where pharmaceutical research failed, yeah? So I'm just putting a cautionary, I'm putting a warning out there and saying, question, question research, question sources, don't just take it as a given. That's all. What do you think? What role does failure play in, in, in your research, Trevor? Personally, or um, <laughs> how does failure? How do you handle failure in the future lab? Um, or how would you define yeah, failure? Yeah, I think it's one of the. It's kind of a cliche in the working world that uh, failing is good. And it's something that a lot of people say and not only in practice, but it's the only way that you learn in a way. And I, I think the one thing we would agree on is <coughs> at some point, as you research, what research does for you, the more informed you are, the more you research, the more diligent you are, the more you read, the more you look, the more you think, the more open-mindedness you will be, the more equipped you will be to make bigger leaps when you've got much more stimulus to gather. And, Failure, in a way, is, is a very good thing. There's a book, so I have a young daughter, and she's got this book called Rosie Revere, an engineer. And it's about this, this little girl who uh, is, I think, seven or so, and she, she continually tries to make things, and they always, they always screw up, they always fail. And her great aunt Rose tells her, your brilliant first failure was a marvelous success. And that's one of the things I think that's interesting about research. Researching is trying, as well as just thinking and observing and writing and, and looking at Google. <laughs> Okay, who else has got something to say in this region over here? Do you, do you want to have a half a question? <coughs> Me? Yeah. Uh, yeah, because you were saying like research isn't in books, it's in the real world. Mm -hmm. But yeah. if you do research in the real world and you want to talk to people about it or share your ideas, you would do it in a book, probably. And mm -hmm. if I read a book, I get a lot of my thoughts of my own. Like, it really helps me think about something and just like sort of yeah. keeps me moving. So, sure. why is that? It can be in a book, but it, you just shouldn't be reading Foucault when you're in Rio de Janeiro. <laughs> that was my point. It's like, that is not the time or the place, you know, to do that. Because actually, you should be there to be experiencing where you are, and the research should be out in the world. And, uh, and that's a particular con context. But of course, you know, I, I read a lot of books, I look at a lot of books. But here's the problem. Kant, the very famous philosopher Kant, yeah, um, apparently hardly ever left his garden. And you could have just like, you know, counted your, you could have timed everything by his regular routines. This is a man who wrote books on the kind of the conditions of thought for all humankind, just to, just to paraphrase. Why would I take that seriously from somebody who never had any life experience? I'm just making a point, you know, I'm just making a point, which is that there's this kind of abstraction of thought, you know, and it, and it seemed to be a form of research, but you know, there has to be a balance, I would say, between that kind of research and thinking that's in books or, you know, on the internet or whatever you're finding, and actually going out and living and getting experiences from the world and recognizing that that's valid. That's not just nothing. I 
Does that make sense? So there's yeah, kind so of a, I kind of agree I'm with not limited in way, but the one thing that's interesting, I think, is the aesthetic of reading something. That if it's on the web or it's in a book, it's mm -hmm. fact. Yeah, absolutely. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of the stuff that you, when you go and talk to people or look, watch things, then you are forming opinions. Yeah. We have this notion that if it's written down there and it's got a number assigned to it, then it's true. And as long yeah. as we're open to this being just somebody's point of view, the author's point of view, absolutely. it's great research. Yeah. Just because it gets into print doesn't mean that it's true. You know that, but then we tend to rely on you know things and say, oh, it must be true because it's in a book. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm just, you know, I'm saying it's the lens. I think that we wouldn't disagree on. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yes. Um, so Sheena, you kind of mentioned in this in this paper, like the idea of um, what that research is is to kind of trouble the pre-given ideas that you may hold. Yeah. Um, and not yeah. about taking as a given what you already hold to be like true. Yeah. Um, and like your presentation was good, and it had a lot of quotes and stuff. Um, that seems to uphold your opinion, but can you tell me like what research you did into an opposing view of your can you give me an example of what you looked at that into opposes a, your opinion? It, it, did I do any research into a into the other side of this question? No, I didn't do any. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe in research. I didn't research this paper, I didn't research, research this tour. It's tears. Yeah, no, I didn't research it because I didn't want to. Um, because um, I knew that he was going to be... against what you said in this first paragraph? Well, you absolutely you can. You can absolutely challenge me, yeah. Like but I would also argue that, I would argue that, um, I, you know, I've been around quite a long time, so I've had a, kind of like a lot of life experience to question these ideas, and I've been in a lot of situations. I've worked in uh, commercial design environments. I've been involved in advertising. I've been involved in a lot of these things. I've seen how research works in these places. So you're right, I am being a hypocrite. I'm taking as a given what I hold to be true, but I guess I'm just, you know, I'm saying that, uh, that, that you're right. I did a, no, of course, of course I'm saying that, but no, but um, what I'm, but what I'm saying is that I, I didn't actually, I wanted to make a very strong claim that wasn't going to have any ambiguity in it, you know, because this is a debate. This isn't a series of nice sort of, you know, yeah. let's everybody agrees, because otherwise what's the point, right? It's just hard to find you reliable as debate as a debater of what you're saying if you haven't done it yourself for this. Um, but it's, oh, no, but I have done it, but I just didn't. I just didn't uh, put it in my presentation. What I'm saying is, I have done it historically. I've looked at oh, these things in many haven't. different. No, I've researched into these things latently for years. Do you know? But I just didn't go out and do specific research and put it in this presentation because there wasn't time. So I couldn't give you the whole. You know, by giving you this kind of super balanced view, I would have been nicking his side of things. That's the whole point about doing a debate, is you take a strong position and you present it. And to Nick Munch, you'd have to research mine first. Yeah, but you didn't come in with any images. <laughs> or he admitted he hadn't done any research either. Yeah. But I think that's yeah. it's an interesting point, because there's also a, a feeling that when we get a question, we have to start from that's scratch. That's a good question. Mm. Right? That research means, okay, we have to do something original. When we're starting a project, or we're starting a piece of work, or we're starting a bit of research, we have to start from ground zero. And, start, and that's... That's what, there was a great, I'll pronounce her name wrong, but a great graphic designer in America did, does amazing graphic design, especially logo design. Um, and she, I think when she was being briefed by Citibank, this is probably a apocryphal story, but she sketched it out on a piece of paper and presented it to the chief executive 15 minutes after they briefed them on what they wanted to do. And he said, well, how could you possibly do something that's worth your quarter a million dollar fee? And she said, I've been practicing for this moment for 25 years. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about the craft yeah, industry. Yeah. But I just want to say to you, what's your name? Adam. Hi, Adam. Great question. You're absolutely <laughs> spot on. Um, I guess all I'm saying is that I have done research into this over the years, but that it would have been really boring for me to be reasonable. So I just didn't be, I wasn't being reasonable in my presentation. I was just being adamant about something that I, you know, feel strongly about. Yeah? But a really good question. You're absolutely right. Okay, there was over there. Was there some question earlier on? So, do you want to say something? Else? Yeah, um, you were saying how you do uh, research into the future and where we're going to be in 20 years, where the world's going to be in 20 years. So, where are we going to be in 20 years? And where is the world? <laughs> <laughs> what like to what topic would you like me to forecast? Yeah, really, I'm quite interested in how you can predict the future. Yeah. Future of design. Yeah. I, Human, human nature. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, God. Poor 
<laughs> well, I guess there's there's some um, the, the one the one constancy, if you will, has been for forevermore is that people are predictable. Humans are predictable. We think that now we're living in a in a um, well, sadly, sadly it is. Um, but we live we're living in an era where we think that everything we're original, all our stimulus is original. Nobody's ever gone through what I've gone through, but your parents have, your grandparents have the same thing, and there's a there's this kind of cliched diffusion of innovation curve thing. You know, the early adopters, late, you know, late majority, all that nonsense. But you can look at what what themes are emerging today and be able to predict with some veracity what people will be doing tomorrow and in years to come. And, and over the course of time, you do that with with a fair amount. The, the more you do it, the better you get at it. I mean, the interesting thing, I suppose, for what's happening with, I suppose, your generation of designers, if I pick design, for example, is is there is um, what's the what's the thing Joma right? Fomo right? Fomo. Yeah. And, and and your I suppose millennial generation is more about today is fuck that like I I don't want all that shit. It's this it's this joy of escapism. There's so much online fakery and and social media fakery that there's a a rejection of a lot of this these perceived selves, these perceived things. You are, we did some research and found that the average person today has about 14 identities. A different person on Facebook than you are on LinkedIn, than you are on, with your parents, than you are at school, than you are with your best friends, than you are on Instagram. And all, each of those is a different identity. And it's so much work to keep up these facades that a lot of that is being rejected. But the impact for design is, is a return almost to craft skills, a return to the real stuff. And all this creationism, faux design senses, I think, one of those things that people will start to reject in a, in a search for more authentic, more real, more cloud-based things, more human design. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, what, nice what, so what are we going to be like in 20 years' time? Stuff out of yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Working, oh. yeah. Foraging oh, yeah. for berries. Foraging for berries. Yeah, foraging. Yeah. I don't think I'll be here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I heard there was a discussion going on over there. Have you got any questions or comments that you'd like to make? We just realized that we, we, we are kind of like you, we were on opposite sides. So I'm pro academic and <laughs> Ghetto is against. More so, experience with yeah. impact. I think it's just the war in self research. Everything is nothing as well. Yeah. So like yeah. I believe why I do research because for most of my tutors, I didn't do anything because they kind of see photographies of the library books of missing, but actually today I learn new skills, look at the world and for me to such experience to you mm -hmm. like yeah, stuff. More yeah. than being outside talking to people, having discussions with your research because I can learn from like white plate covering, which is something that no one taught me here, mm. photography. Mm. So to me, research is not like maybe the academy, but I'm not like can see definitions of research. So maybe we should look like two words or just like the concept itself. The word is quite annoying, just like just sure. saying what for different things that kind of yeah. an issue for us. I think. Well, we were talking about this outside, weren't we? What did you call it? I have no idea. No, I think I think well, I think it's I think well, the one thing we were talking about was that there's people feel like, or we're being taught these days that to be creative we need to uh, let go of your rational behavior, let go of research, and the word research is being, like many words, is being bastardized or given a meaning that may not be its meaning, and some of the most creative like. I, I'm sure none of you have had the pleasure, but some of the most creative people I've ever met are tax lawyers. Bonkers creative people, like the most the most insanely creative minds. But you'd never think that that person would be in the creative realm. Um, but there's a lot of things that we look at and say, that is not a creative thing, or that is not a uh, an exploratory way of doing something, because we have a prejudice about what the word means. And, and as I think one of the things of today is that maybe it opens your mind to what researching is, maybe, it's, maybe the word is the problem, and it's more exploration. Well, I mean, as I was very clear about, I just find this word very depressing. I really do. I find it depressing because I don't really know what it means anymore. I just know that I get told I have to do research, you know, and that probably consists of writing an academic paper for a conference somewhere, 
and then uh, we're going to India, um, and uh, part of part of we're doing, well, you're getting paid for I'm not there actually, but I'm going on research. Well, actually, we're going to India. Of course, we're going to do the conference, but we're also going to be in India. You know, so that's a whole other whole other level of research, just being there, right? But I guess I, I guess for me, it's become one of those things that's become commodified. It's become something that has a kind of value attached to it, a monetary value attached to it within academic circles and with what. And for me, that's just that's wrong. It's about. I mean, we never used to years ago. I mean, I'm showing my age now, but you know, uh, many many years ago, we never used to close your close your eyes, close your ears, Kira, um, on the assessment criteria. We never used to have this word research. We didn't. We just it was assumed that you were doing it, right? It wasn't categorized that way. It wasn't cut off as a part of your work. It would just was. That's how you can say. Show this. So I give value to your work. the subject, I suddenly find myself in the position of being researcher, like I want to know more, I, would go, I want to go further, and then I'm able to do work which um, takes me out of my safety zone, you know, to be like really this, this smart tax lawyer, you know, like being like really creative, why? Because I put in more data, more stimuli to, to actually, you know, think outside the box. So for, for me, research, the way of research, we actually agree, but we just had a different way. idea about, you know, approaching the, the research as a definition. Mm. Research is also to, to going outside and do, and dancing in Rio. Yeah. How just as a sugar cane, you know, but spandex, it's still in part spandex. of the yeah. process. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, I mean, I, I think for me, what I really, I think what I'm really trying to say is, you can't turn it on and off like a TV thing. You can't just switch it on and off. You know, you you might do specific forms of research for certain things, but you know, you might go and kind of be more focused and go and drill down on that particular point. But then, what people tend to do, I see this over and over again in academic situations with students, is they go, oh, I'm going to do a bit of research for this. Let me do that. Shove it in the sketchbook, and then I've done my research. And it's like that is research. That's just Filling the fulfilling the, the the assessment criteria. Mm. If you're doing research, you shouldn't even be questioning. It should always be there with you. Mm. And there might be some times when you're doing a bit more focused stuff, but you don't just turn it on and off. And that's my argument. That I believe in adamantly. Are there any more questions from over? Yes, back there. Yeah. Can I just ask you about the wider research because, from my perspective, a lot of the stuff that both the speakers are saying are actually quite similar, but Sheena seems to have a problem with the word and our preconceived idea of what yeah, research is, is. Because maybe that's something that's kind of like being embedded into society, like what is research? Mm -hmm. But actually, you know, in your experiment with the scent, like the perfume, you're dealing with real people, you're speaking to people, you're, you know, you're interacting. And that's the same as, you know, Sheena in the carnival. You know, it's people and it's Experience. Mm. So. But one is to sell things that we don't need, yeah. and the other is um, about experiencing life in a different way so that you can bring some of that knowledge back to your work, perhaps from the point of view, I'd say. Yeah, I don't, mm. I don't know, I have, I have a more of a, probably a uh, disgusting point of view on this, but everything is capitalist. When you go back to Rio, you have, there's oh, no, you have capital oh, no, now because no, you're dense. Right. Absolutely. Oh yeah, yeah. That is that's totally. personal capital for you. And, Absolutely. Um, and also, it's a very capitalist, excessive um, thing, carnival, yeah. because it's just been, you know, touristified. So yes, absolutely. I was fully aware, fully aware of that as I was dancing down. No, I'm, I mean Russian that again. you are, you are now selling the, the like, like we're all selling ourselves in some ways and yeah. some things. So we are now. I want you. I don't believe this, but I'll say it anyway. I want you to like me more because I have this position. So I'm investing, I'll research this and invest in it so that you will respect me more for my position. Or you will, like all of us, there's currency around having more followers on Twitter. 
Yeah. And we will think about what can I, what can I, what can I tweet today? How, what kind of hashtag can I use? What, what, what picture will I do? So I will get more likes or more followers today because of this thing. And that's research in a way. And, and you're, I think you're absolutely right. There, are, there's a number of words out there. I mean, creativity is a bastardized word. Idea is a bastardized word. I think it means less today than it, than it did at some point. And maybe, maybe somebody will launch a campaign to put the real value back into the word idea. Yeah, I mean, so many of these words, and I absolutely agree, have just become completely empty of any meaning, really, and they are mostly just commodified. They've just become arms of, you know, capitalism. It's all about selling. It's all about selling selling stuff on some level, and everywhere you go, you can't, can't kind of escape that. I like to think of myself, um, many years ago, a friend of mine told me a story about he went to the zoo as a kid, and um, all of the animals in the zoo were kind of lying around being quite docile, except for the warthog, who apparently was still thrashing his head against the cage, and trying to get out, and he said, I'd rather be a warthog than a docile polar bear in life. And I suppose I subscribe to that view that anything that would try and kind of inframe me, I'm going to fight against because that's just in my nature. But then against even that fighting against it is still just, you know, part of some other system, and I completely get that. So, so yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's really, it's, yeah, so what, what, where does that leave us? What's the purpose of research? I don't know, do you? Just thinking. Question. Yeah. Putting yourself out there. Well, I think being... one of the things, one of the one of the other yeah. pressures, the thing that causes a lot of anxiety, especially in some of the work you're doing, is the the kind of craving for originality or pressure to mm -hmm. do something original, think yeah. something original, make something original. Yeah. And research has been seen as this thing that would then, uh, I don't know, make you unoriginal in a way. Because I've, I've looked around the world, I've gathered these things, and therefore I've thought of this, and let's make it slightly derivative. And so there's, there's some rejection of really good observation, exploration, thinking, talking to people, reading things that will make your work completely original because it's been done by you, but fueled by insight and thoughts you've seen before. But I think there's, there's a feeling certainly around that, there's, that by doing a lot of that research, you'll come up with something derivative because you've seen a lot of other things that might have led you to thinking in a certain way. There was a question at the back. There was a question at the back. Yeah. Do you not think that research devalues your opinion? Because, I mean, you're looking outside of yourself. It's kind of saying that all of your life experiences up till then aren't really enough or enough to inform your current thing that you're kind of looking into. So I think that research isn't really necessary. I mean, you just look at you know, your life experiences up till then and let that inform you. And kind of like, um, I think like, with research, you're kind of looking for an answer that is kind of outside of yourself in order to get a bigger picture of something, but really you're not really focusing on on like just like this idea of um, you already kind of have the answer. Like, I feel like you're just trying to uh, quantify something that you can't really get a grasp of. Like um, as if it's just one piece of the puzzle in order to get a full opinion on, on something where you can't really ever get to that. So you're thinking all the answers are latent inside of you already? Yeah. I think to some degree we've all experienced similar things. We all have the same emotions. So why are we trying to look outside of ourselves for the answer? I'd like to take that one on, actually. Um, I'm going to slightly contradict myself, but in a specific context, right? Um, that makes it okay. Yeah, that makes it okay. That, that, was, that was a nice little piece of marketing, uh, marketing speed. I'm going to contradict myself, but in context. Um, I teach dissertation writing elsewhere and, you know, what I would say that life experience is really significant, yes, you have to have that and you have to bring that, right? If you're doing a study into, um, let's say, um, Russian propaganda in posters between the, uh, you know, across the First and Second World Wars, yeah, I doubt that you have the knowledge latently yeah, right. in you to make a claim about that. <laughs> Obviously, that's why, like, I mean, that's just a simple detail that exists outside of yourself. But then well, that's not a simple you, detail, no, that's... I know, but <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm just trying to think that it's a lot simpler than, than it... Like, we're trying to make it so much harder by researching sometimes. I, I think the answer can be very simple by not researching, just using some of your own examples. But obviously, if you're doing market research or research specific research to do with an event, obviously, mm. you're going to need to research it. 
Yeah. But I think intrinsically we all have the same set of values, the same set of emotions. Like why do we need to look outside of ourselves? We're not so alien. Like we need to get so many other people's opinions about this as if we're alien to them. Like I think there's a massive disconnect. Mm. Mm. I'd, lo I'd love to live where you're living. Obviously, <laughs> <laughs> like because you, you need to make money, you, you look at um, creating this scenario where people fit into, but I think there's a massive disconnect. You're trying to create versions of people that don't really need to exist. I mean, mm. them themselves are enough. I think we all are enough as we are. Can I just say one thing? I always get, I mean, I, it's, <coughs> Fascinated by what you're saying, actually. I think it's really, in really interesting, I'm thinking. But I'm going to say something really mean, okay, so please forgive me. How old are you? 21. Okay. Here's what I say to my dissertation students when they write me a paper on propaganda and they say, I think, I think, I think, and they provide not one dot of support for why they think that. I say, why would anybody care about your opinion? You're 21. <coughs> See, I was like, I was Did I hear a slight gasp in the audience? Okay, and you should. And, and then I and then I follow that by saying, why would anybody care about my opinion unless I can support it? Because you're in an academic environment and you have to. Well, it isn't because you actually don't know. You know, you know, you know, squat about that subject, so you can't speak about it with any authority. You know, and so and same for me. You know, I mean, I don't think my opinion on anything is very interesting unless I can kind of support it, which goes to the point this uh, gentleman over here made, you know, where you're not testing your opinions out. So I actually think that's an extremely arrogant position to take, the one you're taking, which is that the whole world is inside you. However, I'm fascinated by the idea that we don't derive... Hmm? I don't, I don't, how is that arrogant? How is that arrogant? How is that not arrogant? What do other people think of this... Um, can I, can I just say, I, I have a slightly different... I, I quite admire that, but I, but I, I suppose the... Um, the trouble with it, because I, I love that, and if I was on a hilltop in India right now, alone, with a plant and some rice, then I'd <laughs> 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 India with us, yeah. we like you, we like but you. I, but, but unfortunately, I'm the authority, like, Sorry? you have your own perspective, I, I respect that, but the way you put that across seemed very arrogant to me. What I just said? Yeah. No, 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 but I think you're... Oh, the, we're the just debating, thing, the unfortunate, come on. Yeah, yeah, I think my, my view is... Yeah. With your opinion. You have different experiences. You can't expect me to. No, but you're. That. But I think the problem with your argument is that you are trying to get us to adopt your opinion. Yeah. And your opinion for that, you have to create an argument. And yeah. your argument has to be based in fact and 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 yeah. experience and other things. So yeah. I, I think you have you have the perfect right to think exactly what you want, and you can have an opinion on on Russian on Russian postmodern art, and that's your opinion. That's perfectly fine to have. But it, but if you would like us to have your opinion on that, then you might have to have some. Mm. Thanks. <laughs> but you got me thinking. You really got me thinking. That's a really, really good, really good question. What is great. Okay, should we have a real argument now? Should we like anybody want to add something to that? Um, I just a little bit. I think that um, research needs to involve our own filter, maybe. So okay, what we so all, would. yeah, like yeah. we're all human, and we all have our own experiences, and we they might be very similar, but we kind of bring those observations. And we can filter all this objective research through that, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good middle position. I guess I guess for me what I'm really trying to say here is just don't just do that sort of separating research out and going, Oh, here's my research and I did it separately. because it's kind of not like you can't, you're creative people, you have to be in it all the time. And filtering constantly and looking and seeing and absorbing all the time. And that is really true. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think that's a beautiful <laughs> note on which to end, unless anybody else has got any urgent comments or questions that they want to um, put forward right now. It's kind of two to one. So. Yes, one more. Yes, hi. Um, I do question research, um, not in a, like, not the point of research. I'm just thinking of, I think you guys are all talking about the process of research and the quality of research. <coughs> and uh, I think there are different kinds of research, like prim primitive research and secondary research, yeah. Oh, yeah, and, of course. yeah, academic research. And I, we, I think we do need to clarify, like what what kind of research and we are talking about. And also, I do question the the the, the proper amount of a research, like uh, illustration tutor. The, their favorite uh, their favorite sentence is that fill up your sketchbook with all the, the drawings and sketches. And I was doubt, 
what is the proper amount of that? Because the more research you do, the further you go from your your original thought, you know, like you just get I don't know, a question like what's the amount so do you feel that the more research you do, it takes you away from where you want to be? Yeah, exactly. Sometimes I feel overwhelmed by like too many, too much information from outside the world, and you just get further and further away from yourself. <coughs> That's in opposition to what we heard earlier from from you, where you were saying, "But research gets me to more, much more new, exciting, interesting questions." Did you not have that experience? I have, but I think it really depends on different breeds and different. Um, Can we just keep the noise down just for the last few comments, please? Thank you. I will just quote from Bruce Mao. It says, build your own tool. And I think uh, research is a, a way of tool. And like, you, I do think we need to build our own way of researching. And there is not a standardized way that we can say That's a good point. Which, one, which one is good, which one is not. It really depends on what kind of person you are and what kind of brief you are given. Mm -hmm. Just be creative. I don't think there is a, a certain way of doing research. Yes, and question what wants yeah. to present itself as objective. Mm. Yeah, just mm. be slightly skeptical or look at things mm. more closely, I would say. But I think your question about how much research is a really difficult one yeah. because I would say that if you have to ask that question, then you're not really fully doing research because you, do, you should also, it should be there with you all the time, you know, it should never leave you. Um, but, um, but then again, you know, I know that point you're saying, if you just go off onto so many tangents, it's very difficult to come back. So I guess there's certain times when your research has to be more contained and other times when there's this constant background research that's constantly going on, yeah. that's always a part of how you practice. To be fully practicing means to be involved in that way all the time. So but I agree that that's a difficult question. Well, let's draw it to a close now. Thank you very much to both of us. Thank you.